So Ian Yela was born in Toronto, Canada to a father who immigrated from East Germany and a mother who immigrated from Ireland. Uh, he studied computer science and philosophy here at American University and then switched mental gears to study art at the Kansas City Art Institute, Brandeis University, and then completed his um, MFA at Columbia University in 2000. He's exhibited widely in North America, Europe, and Japan. In 2014, he participated in the National Drawing Invitational at the Arkansas Art Center with some of the portraits <laughs> that we see here in the gallery. Uh, now he splits his time between Berlin and Washington, D.C., where he's currently a faculty member in the art department. And until recently, he supported his art career as a construction engineer. <laughs> um, Professor Dr. Nate Harshman is a mathematical physicist and an expert in symmetry in quantum mechanics. He spent his research career chasing what Eugene Wigner called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. So maybe we'll find out what that means. He got his PhD in theoretical particle physics, physics from the University of Texas at Austin and then taught himself quantum information theory as a postdoc at Rice University. He eventually shifted into few body physics in ultra cold atomic systems. He has also done a little scholarship, he says modestly, along the way in the philosophy of physics and physics education research. He's been at American University since 2003 and is currently department chair of physics and director of the NASA DC Science Grant Consortium. So thank you for participating. Uh, so Nian, Ian, I'm going to ask you to start off because it's your exhibit. And um, I know I'm the one who twisted your arm and convinced you that portraits can go with your more dynamical systems. But can you tell us a little bit about the different components of the exhibit? Well, I mean, you set it up exactly. I mean, I, I have these two separate bodies of work. Um, the portraits I began in, when I was actually in graduate school, um, uh, they were, they came out of, um, uh, you know, at that time, the late 90s, uh, you know, and, and being in New York and being in the New York art world, um, there was a lot of, uh, it was a time of very high concept art and, um, I, of course, also being there, I had the opportunity to go to a number of openings and being in New York, you meet a number of people. And I felt very much that, um, you know, the, the art that I was seeing in New York at that time had moved away from, you know, what I thought the impact of art could be. In other words, I, to actually move people, to actually make people feel something different than when they, before they looked at it. Um, I felt there was a sort of an enormous kind of intellectual remove and sort of coming from philosophy I also recognized bullshit when I heard it um, So that was also part of it. Um, I did not necessarily think that even even some of the the Philosophical tropes at that time were particularly even even that interesting. So what I started to do was um, you know, I was uh, was going to events and to openings in New York and I started making Surreptitious people of surreptitious portraits of well-known people in the art world. They started out as sketches, and then I thought, no, I'm going to make these sort of monumental portraits. And you know, really, what I was trying to do, for the most part, is is humanize or show as vulnerable people who were, in many ways, kind of pillars of the art world and not seen really as as human beings. And just to see what kind of reaction I would get, frankly. I mean, I also knew that there was a chance that some of these people would come into my studio and actually see it. And, uh, you know, what, what, what would the impact be? If I, if I could make an art world luminary somehow not be able to speak, I thought, wow, that's an accomplishment, you know? So, um, you know, and, and that, that continued. Um, you know, I, I definitely took, you know, drawing was very important in that. I, I actually started out painting, but, it, but drawing was very important in that process because I wanted the looking to be somewhat at a remove, somewhat analytical. And I think drawing is very good for the representation of kind of more, more analytical observation. 
um, because I wanted to get myself out of the portraits as much as possible. If someone came and saw their portrait, I wanted them to see themselves, not to see me. And so, um, you know, the, the opposite example would be someone like Balthus, right? Where Balthus is that dirty old man in the room. That's part of what Bal Balthus's presence is very part of those paintings. I wanted it to be the opposite, very, very separate. And so when I came to DC, at first I was doing New York People. That, that felt a little shrill because I wasn't seeing, I, I was seeing, sorry, at the beginning I was still doing New York People. That seemed, you know, those were not my world. It started to seem a little bit dishonest. And so I started drawing um, people from the Washington art world, just people I would see around, some of them more well-known than others. Um, and I would make these kind of unauthorized, unsolicited portraits. And, uh, you know, it's been interesting to see because it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, people have had different reactions over time, you know, to the portraits. Um, some positive, some negative. People have read tremendous things, tremendous meanings on my part. And uh, I think, okay, I'm actually, if it's eliciting that kind of a response, I'm actually doing my job. Um, so, you know, simultaneous to that, I was working uh, as a construction engineer, and, and that was work that was uh, very much, uh, you know, when it was busy, you were there until one and two in the morning, and, but also when you weren't, you weren't. And so I was very often, you know, sitting in front of AutoCAD all day, I was very often playing little games, little math games to, with myself, um, basically just to see oh, would this shape fit into this shape? Would this shape fit, in, fit into this shape? But they also went, they, they came out of um, starting to, you know, at first uh, on YouTube and then, then in other places, just um, I sort of got hooked on learning about math, um, picking up on some of the math that I'd left off from my days in computer science. So uh, in different areas of mathematics, their visual representations, where those visual representations crossed over, where something, where a mathematical visualization was in one area, but it seemed so similar to a completely different area in mathematics, visually the representation was very similar, and I thought, okay, well, what, what would, as an artist, you know, what could I do with that? So, you know, um, I, I essentially, you know, with, that, with, the, with this work, it started out much smaller than this, um, I... Uh, I would see an idea that I thought was interesting, and I would, you know, if I could come up with a question about it that I couldn't answer, um, uh, you know, say some sort of, of, of mathematical representation of something, and I thought, well, I wonder what would happen if, that's what started the experimentation. And so that, of course, led to more experimentation, and then you start to think of different variations of things, and you start to research the mathematics that that brings up, which gives you new ideas. And then you think, oh, what if I modify it? What if I make it turn-based? What if I change certain parameters of the spacing that I'm using? And so, you know, I started to realize that uh, making art as visual experiments that were very closely tied to principles or representations in math was really, really interesting. I mean, I could stay up all night um, coming up with, with different permutations of things. So... Um, you know, I, that work started to move, as I started to move out of engineering, that work, and I was not having to work in that field all the time, now all of a sudden I could do it on my own, so the mathematics started to become more prominent in the, um, in the work that I was doing. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, it, it's very simply, I mean, I, I am, you know, I, I read quite a bit in, in certain areas of mathematics, um, uh, optimization is probably the biggest one, um, uh, projective geometry, uh, uh, other areas, not to go to get too math nerdy into it, but, um, you know, and I'm looking for things that are interesting experiments, things that I don't know. What could I do to something, to a shape, to a form, to a plane, um, to a thing, and what could I do to it that would, would create something that I don't know what the answer would be and that I'm curious about what the answer is. And also something where hopefully 
the information is carried through in the exploration as I represent it. And that's, of course, very important to me as well. You know, it's not just to sort of see the result of some experiment. Oh, it made a pretty picture. If that pretty picture doesn't resonate back to its source, I generally discard it. So that's a very broad description. I hopefully that wasn't too much in depth. Um, but uh, yeah. So, Perfect. Perfect. Know. So we, we can talk about some of the individual works a little bit later, but um, even if we discard the right brain, left brain terminology, um, I see this as sort of two different ways of visualizing the world, of making sense of the world, <laughs> and two different creative processes maybe. So Nate, do you want to talk a little bit about how you see the scientific creative process different from say, making a portrait. Um. Sure. Well, I think the first thing that I want to uh, uh, bring in to this discussion when we talk about creativity is, is right, in science, I, I often describe the, I mean, we have this thing called the scientific method, but what I like to talk about is this process where you go from data, right, the raw, the raw sense data of the world, and then but you have to pay attention to certain things. You can't pay attention to everything. And in the process of going from, from choosing which data you pay attention to, you move to what I call information, right? You, you, you decide what, what is black and what is white and what is zero and what is one. And you begin to turn that into a, a more, um, to, to a quantitative description of this, this sense data. But, but then the next step and the hardest step is how do you actually turn that information into knowledge? How do you then evolve that into a truth statement, right? The final step, how do you go from knowledge to wisdom, I'm not going to talk about. That's not my wheelhouse. But, um, but right, so, so one of, so, right, so in science, we are trying to create truth, right? And we have a certain set of, of we, have, we have sort of a, a duality of two different methods. And, and often science can even be thought of as a, a battle between these two methods, between the deductive method of starting with true things and making algorithmic deductions of new knowledge, right? So starting from the, the true axioms and deducing to that, to, the, to, the, to specific new truths. And then the other approach where you, you take your sense data and you try to induce the general from the particular, right? And so uh, I happen to be a mathematical physicist, and so my main method of inquiry is deduction. And, uh, and there are experimentalists, right, who uh, typically who really are the ones who then try to take the experimental data and turn that into a general theory. And so uh, both of these kind, uh, so, so the deduction process is very algorithmic, right? You, you really have steps you're following, steps like the steps that generate, uh, uh, what's, what's the name of this? The tiling challenge. The tiling of challenge. Yeah, so, so that, that's a very algorithmic process to me, right? And, and some people, when I say algorithmic, they feel that's cold, mm. right? But it's not cold. Algorithmic is hot, right? <laughs> it is the hot generation of knowledge, of new true things, and the process is, is part, is manifest in it when, it, when it is good truth that way. Um, but where, uh, and, then, and then the induction process, that is more obviously something where you really have to sometimes, you, you can never prove an induction, right? Going back to Hume, that's just not something we're going to be able to do. So there is a, a leap of faith uh, that I think is a creative act when you do that process. And so why I sometimes rebel against the right brain, left brain? Well, first off, there's some... Uh, the psychology of the, the neuroscience of left brain, right brain l leaves much to be desired. And, and I think it reinforces, it, it forgets how plastic our brains are. And, and so for me, I want us all to always remember how plastic our brains are and how you can, you can use both parts of your brain and train both parts of your brain and become very different. But, um, but, but uh, the, what it is a good metaphor for it, and, uh, is that, right, we often then associate the right brain with the creativity and the left brain with the algorithmic thinking. But again, I, as with any dichotomy, I want to undermine that because you actually need creativity in the algorithmic process and you need structure in, in the creative process. And so uh, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's, a, it's a duality that is so appealing because we can see ourselves in it 
right? And it's like a horoscope, right? You read the horoscope and, oh, yes, well, I am very interested in food, you know? And you're like, oh, well, every, every, every Libra must be, right? So, uh, but, but, right, so uh, that, that's what I, I, I think that, uh, so when I think about creativity, uh, I, science is a creative process in both of these modes, and I don't see it in conflict with art, and I think the best scientists are very, uh, tap into uh, a very intuitive and artistic process. Now, maybe, again, I, I'm being naive here about the artistic process, but... Ian, do you want to talk more about your artistic process? <laughs> uh, sure, uh, I would. I mean, you know, in my case, um, you know, part of what convinced me that this could be good art was um, watching, in, in, for me specifically, mathematicians actually describe um, how algorithms or certain theorems work. And, you know, very often where, where I found myself was that, you know, if, if people would, particularly at lectures and things where they were giving demonstrations, I would look at that demonstration and then the kind of visuals which were sometimes people writing, you know, on a whiteboard as incredibly beautiful, right? And incredibly creative. And I thought that a lot of mathematical work didn't, wasn't as good, you know, wasn't as interesting. It was kind of a, um, it was a result that happened to be, that happened to be maybe beautiful or mysterious, but it didn't, um, it didn't make you want to understand this thing and see how amazing it was. It didn't speak back to its purpose. And so, for me, I started to feel like, um, yeah, I was interested in certain types of visuals, but I wanted to do something where that kind of enthusiasm, but also that kind of, the, f the feeling that this, is in, that this has meanings that I am maybe just barely grasping or not able to get, but that it's in there, and it makes you want to know. And, you know, that was very much the motivation. With that, though, I think we're talking almost completely about the creative side of it. And I think, um, so, you know, that, that was the part that I was interested in. It's funny because as an artist, I think in a lot of ways, um, uh, you know, I, I think, I, you know, I think there is a desire very often among, um, you know, uh, uh, people who work in more analytic fields to get to their creative side. And I sort of feel like I more want to shine a mirror on the creative side that you're already showing, if that makes some sense. You've used analytic now. Can you tell me what analytic means to you? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, analytic to me would be to... Um, uh, in terms of, of more, let me say, more analytic art, how would I define that? It's, it is, I would say to, um, it would be work that would be based on making uh, uh, an observation and applying a sort of consistent consideration or consistent filter about that and then seeing what the results would be, right? You're simply an observer to the results of your own work. It's not, it's not a feeling or a moment that you're trying to capture and embody and, and bring out. It's an experiment that's going through you, and you, you're in similar position to the, as an artist, you're in a similar position to the viewer. You don't know what it's going to be either. Um, not that necessarily analytic work has to be unknown, but that it's, it's this idea of, um, you know, sort of filtering the input in such a way that the result is not predetermined. That sounds a little bit like the scientific method, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or at least yeah. the idealization of the scientific method. Sure. Um, well, one thing that we talked about briefly yesterday was that um, getting to truths, visualizing, making sense of the outside world is true for both sciences and the arts and humanities. But um, expression, <laughs> expression of feelings and emotions, which we've got a great example right here. <laughs> Um, is not necessarily part of the scientific method or kind of what what sort of you you try to achieve as a mathematician or as a physicist. 
Yeah, th that's so. And something sort of playing off of that, and something you just said, right? When you were describing analytic, what it really remind me, right, is is almost trying to describe an objective process, right? Uh, and in right, and in science, we are obsessed with objectivity, and uh, and I think sometimes, uh, uh, I mean, well. You know, in the history of science, certainly there are many t places where we've overreached in our uh, acknowledgement of, uh, or in our assessment of our own objectivity. I mean, the first step of attention is always uh, a, a, a subjective step, right? You, whatever you're paying attention to, that's the first step. You are, you're making a choice what to pay attention to. Um, uh, so, uh, when you talk about feelings, right? So I, I taught a class with Richard Shaw, who's a professor in literature here, and one of the great lessons I learned, it was called Bridging the Two Cultures, Science and Literature, and one of the great lessons I, I learned from that class was that uh, great literature found truth through story, right? And story was not something that I could, um, that I could access. Uh, all the time through uh, either of my two inductive or deductive methods, right? So there are ways of generating truths, and, and the quality of those truths may even be different, right? An emotional truth may have a different quality than some of the, the, the uh, more physical, physically or structurally grounded truths that I'm talking about. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, so I, I think that's what I'm saying <laughs> about that. Um, one of the really wonderful things about this exhibit is that Ian included his students, and several of them are here today. Um, so I wonder if Rose, who is kind of the lead on this algorithmic tiling game, could tell us a little bit about how, how that worked. <laughs> what, what was the object? Um, did it evolve in the way that you anticipated? So we change a lot. <laughs> We've been working on this piece for a whole year. Um, and at first, um, I didn't know what, you know, it's going or what art, what kind of art this is about. I just kind of follow Ian's direction. And when he asks for my opinions, I would be like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know what you want. <laughs> um, but then, um, I guess as the you know the work evolve, I kind of you know understand more about. I'm not a mathematician, but um, I you know I know the process and how. What were the rules for the game? Mm. Yeah, the, the are you ask that's a question. The rules for the game, um, like like rules. <laughs> um, so it's just building um you know each plane off of each other and um the blue is the you know the the blue is the you know the the um the front and the red is kind of the the um, the, the top and the side so and it goes you know on top of each other and we change rules so many times <laughs> even um during the during the show it kind of you know evolve all the time um, so I think, uh, you know, as a student, I feel that, you know, like I, it's opened a new kind of, you know, experience about art making and as like, I, I see more art making as a, you know, research and more, you know, um, kind of experiment and a lot of research, a lot of, um, just trying and it's not, it's not just about, you know, like, I don't know, like, you know, the art we know in, in the, you know, undergrad art classes. So that's, yeah, the, the best experience for me. So it sort of changed your idea about yeah. art making. Mm -hmm. And also over time, I, I think I developed confidence, <laughs> in, you know, expressing my opinion. And I feel like, um, you know, your opinion is legitimate. When I go to museums now, I, I have confidence and, you know, saying that, yeah, I, I hate that art, or I like that art, and <laughs> yeah, so it comes from just working for Ian. <laughs> yeah. M Mario, do you want to chime in about your involvement with this project? Maybe about the, uh, talking a little bit about the Hilbert space? Um, yeah, so I think I, I mainly focused on, <clears throat> over the summer, 
Hello? Yeah. So over the summer, uh, we mainly focused on the bungee cords. Uh, I was just doing prototyping. Um, we hadn't figured out angles yet. That was kind of more uh, once we got into the space. Uh, Ian did this AutoCAD like rendition of it. Um, so then we kind of went off there. Um, and then the blue and green piece, um, I also worked on over the summer. Um, but yeah, I think as we got into this space, the, the two pieces changed um, from what they were originally. Um, and I think that it's just kind of the nature of like art and math. Like as you discover more things and as you, uh, you know, over time you tend to take what you know and like adapt it to whatever it is that you're facing. Mm -hmm. um, um, well, as a non-math person, um, when I when I saw the, what Ian was installing here, I thought of art examples um, like Solowit wall drawings and things like that. And to me, it just struck me as very interesting, colorful design. But I wondered when, Nate, when you first came in and you were looking at the bungee cords and everything, how did you make sense of it? How did it strike you? So... I am fascinated by symmetry. And, and maybe I'll start just by telling a little story, right? So uh, the most famous piece of mathematical literature is Euclid's Elements. So in the 13 books of Euclid's Elements, in some sense, we're all to get to the one result that if you are in three dimensions and you are trying to make a shape uh, a three-dimensional object in which every single side is the same is a regular polygon. It's like a triangle or a square, and every single vertex is the same. Getting all so, so you put these rules on the game, and you say, we're working in space with the rules of geometry. You find there are only five ways to do that, the five platonic solids, right? And so this idea that an abstract set of rules about symmetry can induce uh, structures, right? Structures that then are inevitable because these structures were known before Euclid and it was just that Euclid showed that they were a complete and inevitable consequence of putting structure into space. So when I see this uh, geometrical work and, when I, and of course what I really also of course feel uh, not exactly on the same point is I feel the tension of it so acutely right because these are bungee cords right and so I think of the actual tension in the objects and the, the tension that must the, the forces that are on the eye hooks that are pinching it together right that's a mechanics problem that I teach my students I could solve I can solve that problem right uh, I, I could put a numbers on that so, so I have those two feelings right the, the way that uh, the, 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 the repetitiveness is a kind of symmetry, a translational symmetry, and then you have the sort of rotations of the different wires, but changing the colors is a kind of broken symmetry. So I have all of that sort of the way the, the, yeah, the, the lines structure the space combined with the really dynamic element of, of, of the structural objects under tension. Do you have a question? <laughs> you look like you're... <laughs> <laughs> okay, just ab absorbing. Okay. Um, well, one one thing that you brought up in our discussions is that unlike um, kind of the way that you would have to think as an engineer about tension and about structure, uh, when you are working as an artist, you might be using the same kind of engineering materials or language but you don't have to, it doesn't have to be like a bridge that holds anything up. It's, it, there, there's no real um, kind of proof. It doesn't have to accomplish anything um, practical. Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, you're touching on two things there, both with the material and with the, the sort of goals of the work. Um, the material at first, um, you know, coming from an engineering background, to be honest with you, the, the, the part that's interesting to me is the sort of layers of abstraction that you deal with, right? You deal with math first, and then you deal with um, physics, and then you deal with engineering, and each one can be seen as an abstraction of the other. 
And so this idea of, you know, what's the concrete in the whole thing is, you know, it's constantly, you know, one person's variable is, is another person's constant, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, to the point that, for example, when we're looking at buildings in a landscape or, you know, the way headlights work or whatever, there's basically this geometry projected in, into the world in this way. And, and if you push hard enough, you can pretty much, the, the whole thing collapses underneath that. And so, um, you know, I found that this whole idea of this sort of constant sort of translation, right? You know, you, you deal with math, and math leads to physics, calculating forces, and then forces, and then, of course, calculating forces is what engineers do, and they deal with drawings and creating buildings. But then those drawings become plans, and then those plans become a shell of a building, which in a way shows the plans even more, and then people live in the building. And so, you know, each one, each sort of step, step along that process is, is, is an abstraction. So... I, sort of speaking to that and coming from that environment, I wanted to use those materials. The other part of it is, I mean, the whole universe of color, I mean, God, I would love to do, I mean, we, we could sit and I'd love to do a full lecture on uh, talking about color, but, um, you know, the thing with, uh, that I also really admire, it's also what I grew up with in, in the sort of um, construction world palette, are things that things operate as colors, but also as symbols, right? You are supposed to know that this is from this brand, right? It is red. And then the next brand, the competitor is blue. The competitor is not going to be red slightly different because then you would never be able to see it. So the red functions as a marker. It also functions as a symbol. And then it also, um, but then of course, it's got all the sensations that you associate with red or green or blue. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very, I have a lot of admiration with, uh, with that, with that world. And again, with the colors that both the colors that come with it and the materials. Um, yeah, I think actually then simultaneously, I spoke about the same thing related to the abstraction with the ideas. I mean, um, you know, when it comes to the math, I think that I feel like I'm in this wonderfully privileged position because I have just enough uh, math knowledge, math background to understand the concepts, to understand what they're tied to, but I have the absolute freedom of not ever having to come up with a proof or ha <laughs> ever having to come up with anything that is mathematically important. I could arrive at something that someone else has arrived at 200 years ago, but if I do it in an interesting way, that's fine with me. I'm, you know. Yeah, the tyranny of progress. Yes. Right? Uh, and, and again, I, 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 we can problematize progress, but we have to admit that in science and mathematics, progress is easier to identify in many cases, right? It, I can do this function better, more efficiently, or, or something that nobody else has ever done, right? I mean, aspirin and whatever. Like, I mean, right, we know that uh, there is some essential truth to progress in mathematics proving new ideas and in science leading to new technologies. But it is true that as a scientist then, uh, I can't tell you the number of times where as a mathematical physicist, I have come up with a beautiful model and then the referee report says, yeah, but we're not going to make this out of atoms, right? Like where, where the, the beauty of the thing is not, is not sufficient for me in mathematical physics. I have to have something that then can be realized by physical objects. And it does, uh, uh, does sometimes, uh, for some people that is the, ma that is the joy most joyful thing, and for others of us it is, it is a, 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 an extra burden of proof we have to put that what we're doing is, uh, is a value. I'm literally turning in my file for action to be promoted for full professor tomorrow, so uh, I may be particularly um, sensitive about the <laughs> quality of my work today. People evaluating the last 20 years of my research over the next few months will, uh, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, uh, the other thing I just want, yeah, yeah, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, and in particular, I, I want to just sort of to link that back to the idea of emotion you said earlier, right? And that may be something why it's so hard for us in the sciences to deal with the emotional content of things because it is, that is so, so clearly subjective, 
so clearly tied to the observer and so, uh, so far from universal and so close to particular, it's hard for us to, within the, the cage of progress, to, to, to hold on to those kinds of truths and feel confident that we're going to get tenure. Um, or get promoted. Uh, uh, the, the other, the other. You also commented about again about the the, the structural aspect. Uh, and, and again, I, I think that that one thing that I'm particularly also interested in how this happens. So this is a question for you, right? Is that even if you have a set of well-defined rules, and I understand the rules changed as the game went on, it's the seed. The seed where you start can be random, right? You, you randomly put the first tile there or course, you yeah. orient it this way, right? And so then uh, the, something happens there. Well, of course. I mean, randomness is in mathematics, and so introducing random elements, um, uh, you know, is, is uh, you know, that, that's also part of setting up rules-based systems. You know, you, once you set the rules, then the rest is let to run, and, you know, randomness rules. Um, you know, in the case of changing it, I want to make, make it clear, it was, it's a consistently, consistent algorithm through, but what happens is, as Rose knows, because, you know, she's, as much time as she's taken putting up tape in her, in her uh, artist assistant career, she's, she's done more time taking down tape because there is a lot of um, themes and variations that come in. And so very often, especially with work like this, you're doing it in the studio and you think, oh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting set of rules. I messed around with the set of rules. I came up with that. I think that's interesting. You come into the gallery and you uh, go by that set of rules, and then you put it up, and you realize, oh, I think of it. I think of a more interesting one, and I have no idea what the answer is going to be. So let's just do that. And so um, you know that's where that part comes up with. Um, and then you know if if I could pivot slightly, um, I would really you know uh, because just talking about. Um, uh, you know, the students I've worked with, um, Amy Rose and Mary are my regular studio assistants, but then, you know, there's been a whole group of them, you know, working on this project here. You know, tying it again into science, uh, this idea of art as a group activity um, is kind of huge. Um, it really, really, as a collaborative experience, um, you know, I set up the rules. There's no question about that. But seeing other people... Um, work with the rules and seeing what patterns and even sort of what reactions they're having, it's, I, I couldn't have done it. I could not have done it without um, other people participating. Um, so, you know, this idea of letting an experiment run, you need other people and you need their feedback. Um, and so it, uh, you know, I think that's already a long established thing in obviously in science, uh, uh, maybe less so in math, but, um, but I, I, I think that's an incredible parallel. And then, you know, also then that starts to bring up things about pedagogy and education and this idea of, of artists and whether we like it or not, artists and, and scientists very often, we, we kind of have an apprentice system. We don't really call it that, but we really sort of do. And there's something very important about that as well for both parties, right? Both the, both the apprentice and the, the teacher. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, speaking of apprentices and students, do any of you have questions? Yeah. <laughs> I just um, wanted to say that I like just want to second what Ian was saying, and I think that like he also he's a faculty advisor for the Art Students Guild, and um, he kind of. We do help him with his own personal work, obviously, like he he has given us all jobs, and he like really fosters all of our individual talents like I was not so good at geometric shapes I'm more of a messy artist, but you know he he really is dedicated to like making sure that students succeed and like even from the beginning, like a lot of the kids that are in the art program are there because he saw their talent in a gen ed class and picked them out. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. Uh, thank you <laughs> nice for that. To hear. And um, I was just, so this is like a systems-based 
um, painting, but basically, but have you ever like, I don't know, what, like, uh, do you ever like making the systems like fully by yourself and like smaller? I know you kind of tinker before, definitely. Oh, oh yeah, it's mostly tinkering. It's mostly really bad tinkering is what I want to say. Like there are lots and lots of notebooks with um, very badly drawn little geometric games that I think will lead to something interesting and they never do. Some of your drawings in the catalog. Yes, yes, <laughs> we did. And so really most of, that's where most of the work happens to be honest with you in terms of figuring things out, coming up with ideas. Um, you know, it's, uh, I say this to students all the time, you, you've probably heard me say it before, um, you know, as you get, as you become, go further and further in your art career, you think, oh, I need less preparation, less preparatory drawings, I have to do less kind of homework. And it's the exact opposite. The further you go along, actually, the more homework you do. And so, um, you know, and, and then therefore you have to love the homework that you do. There's just, uh, there's absolutely no other way to do it because if it's not keeping you up at night, um, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's sustainable in the long term. So yes, the, the simple answer is yes. There are, are a lot of little goofy things. I, I, let's see, I, I think I have one in my, I always keep a, several notebooks on me at all times. This one is nearly full of little goofy things that I've thought up along the way, so. Hi, Ian. Hey. Um, so, Working on the blue and green piece, um, I had a lot of questions about like where I was going and like he had a random angle generator. It was all part of it, like the randomness. And sometimes when it would come up, I'd be like, are you sure that's what you want to do? And I was wondering, because for me, when I'm doing work, it's heavily based off of like I make a decision. I'm like, yeah, that feels right or that looks right. Like, as an artist, are you constantly kind of fighting that, mm, like, is that correct? Like, or is it just easy for you to trust the system that you developed? Like, is there any sort of struggle there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. No question about it. Because, you know, that, and that goes into the collaboration a little bit. Because if I'm getting a sense that a, a, an idea, an algorithm won't yield something that to my eye is interesting, I know I always have the option to change it. So I'm always weighing whether I kind of abandon the, the experiment. Um, and so, you know, that's part of why you guys making it helps because I can actually walk away and then see what happens, you know? Um, and, uh, but yes, yeah, so, you know, uh, Again, being, being you know, that's, that's the sort of drawback to, to being the artist is that I really have free will for under any circumstances to change it. And sort of resisting that and saying, hey, this is interesting is, that takes a little bit. It takes a little bit. Um, you know, you get, you get better at it in the sense that, you know, part of it is just as you get, uh, you work as an artist for a long time, you've seen a lot of things. And after a while, you just you want to be intrigued um, more than even seeing something nice. And I think that's kind of like uh, when I when I can put something down or or something comes up and I say, oh, that's interesting. I didn't expect that. Then that's good. I feel like I've had a good day, you know. And so that's that kind of helps with that. If that makes sense. That's so funny because that is so that that delight when something surprises you. Uh, when you're doing a calculation, right? That is, ab you have described very similar, that, that delight you feel when you're like, okay, well, I'll, I'll start with these axioms and I'll see what I can pull out of here. And then you suddenly get to the thing, it's like, oh, well, that's the same symmetry as a snowflake. And then, and then you write that paper. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Elise? Is this on? Okay, good. Um, 
while I'm sitting here and listening to your wonderful brains tell me about this exhibit, it occurred to me that I had this really similar experience in an interesting way to what this whole exhibit is about. So I just wanted to share that with you for a minute. Um, I'm married to an architect and uh, he was busy getting rid of blueprints uh, about a year ago. He came to me with this huge roll of blueprints. He said, do you want to do something with these? And I said, absolutely, don't throw them away. And I started looking at them and working with them. And I got to look at his work very, very cl close range. You know, I've been married a long time to this person and I've seen him draw and come up with his concepts and I've seen him put into CAD drawings and all of that. But these were old blueprints, so they were all hand drawn, something you don't see anymore. And I got to have this very intimate experience with the blueprints and on top of the blueprints were his handwritten notes. And so as I'm looking at the floor plans and I'm looking at the rooms and the circulation patterns and the symbols for a toilet and a staircase and whatever, I see his handwriting. And it just, it's like a moment like you just described. It was a beautiful moment of like, here is the brain creating this crisp, clean, accurate, buildable plan. It's, it makes sense, it's gonna be protective and safe and here's his handwriting, and it's like the mess of human existence, right there on top of the order. And that, that's like what you've done here. So I, like, it was like a little light went off about 15 minutes ago, hey, <laughs> I had this experience that's just like this exhibit. So I thought it would be interesting to just share that with you. Uh, that's Thank awesome, you. actually. <laughs> I, I absolutely love that description, too, because you know, when I talk about sort of tracing the origins, you know, the fact that you're, you're essentially saying you're, you're seeing your husband in all his humanness move through these ideas and form these ideas, that is really good art to me. You know, that becomes so, the ideas are all encoded, but the process by which they made and the very sort of human person who's there, you know, is, in, is embedded there too. I'm like, oh, oh, that's good, that's good. I might have to copy that actually. <laughs> What I liked about the story was just, uh, again, architects, as you said, have to make things that are safe and stable. And so they also have this constraint upon them where they can't let their imagination or, or their creativity run unconstrained. And of course, it is sometimes those constraints on, on our creativity that is where the surprise comes out and the insight and the brilliance and the, the really exciting things is how do you balance these constraints with uh, your human creativity. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think that, you know, when we were talking about left brain, right brain, I mean, part of where that went was where you kind of reframed it as sort of inductive and deductive work. And I think that's actually a much better frame. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, this particular piece was, it's one of the very few that I did with the kind of permission of the sitters, first of all. That, that's really, really unusual for me. Partly because um, Richard and Lena, they knew my work and they said, oh, you know, would you put us in a piece? And so I actually sat on it for years. I thought, no, you know, I, I you know, I, I, Doing it to for at someone's request is a, is a little bit different, but um, you know enough time had passed, and I saw them at uh, an event and uh, at an art event, and I just said, oh, you know, I, I saw these two kind of art buddies, these sort of both simultaneously hip and nerdy art buddies, and I said, okay, right now, you know, kiss. And I I asked them to do it, and then I realized, like, oh, you know what, just for just for, you know, kicks. Now I want you to just pretend to be kissing the other one. And so I took individual, very rapidly, on the telephone, very rapid pictures of them reaching out to kiss each other. And I thought, you know, when I, I went back and I, I looked at the pictures and I thought, and I did some drawings of each of them, I thought, oh, this is more interesting 
the this kind of this sort of autonomous kiss, that sort of reach for the kiss, the sort of um, the awkwardness of it. Uh, and I thought, okay, yeah, no, that's that's right. That's that's interesting to me. That is revealing in a way that is not too easy to name. And um, I, you know, so I I. I made that work. I made I made pictures of them individually, and then I, you know, blew up the pictures, and um, you know, it it started to become about you know what formally how are they different from each other, and you know that 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 hair was such a big part of it. So, sort of you know the one person and and all the things that could be encoded in that in that hair were one thing and then you know the other person in in uh, and Lena in the hair as well and so um i just poured myself into working on that structure th saying that you know what this is all there it's all there and it's going to if i do it because at this point it's a giant piece it's a map it's going to be there and so, um, yeah, I, I was, I have to say, I was happy with the result. And that's, you know, when you work on a piece as long as, as something like this does, uh, takes, you don't, you don't always know that right away. You know, you're very close to it by the end. But, uh, no, I was very, I was very happy with it. Well, I literally did a little sketch and then I projected much to the, um, the shock and disappointment of my, of my niece. I projected my own drawing onto a larger piece of paper. And she said, you're copying. And I said, but I'm copying from myself. <laughs> she said, yeah, it's still copying. It's still copying. So, um, but yeah, so that's, uh, so it, 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 the, the, the production became in many ways about reproducing that, that kind Yeah, yes. Of course, yes, of course, and and in a lot of ways, I think that, um, you know, I, you know, I'm I'm, I think very often, very all, and I say this to my students also, very often the most emotional subjects need the, they they come out best when when the, when the view when the point of view is the is the most objective and the most removed in a way. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, th I think that can be, I, I think that can be the most effective, the most interesting to me. You know, I think the saddest, you know, when an actor acts, the, the sort of saddest scene is when you see an actor trying not to show that they're sad rather than being sad on, on stage. And so um, I think that, uh, you know, it, it you know, in terms of laying bare the subject, as as taking that analytic approach was 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 a calculated thing. Um, I see um, more of an intimate connection with you in this work, especially um, where you're not being so objective, and where we can see like every line of the hair, and there's obviously so much care to creating these textures and just. To, to see that human touch, which we don't see in all of your work. Yeah, yeah, I guess the, 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 hmm, the human touch, I would, I would be honest with you, is probably not something I think about the touch. I do think I'm a big believer that touch is very, very important in art, but I think as soon as you become aware of it, then you have to move away from it. Um, so it's something that I try not to uh, let myself be too conscious of. Um, and uh, um, yeah, yeah, I think that it's, it's very important. If, if that can come through, I'm very, very happy about it. Um, but at the same time, um, yeah, I don't want to, uh, all I can do is, is give everything to the portrait, um, try to see it as, as best I can see it, and then hopefully that if I stand out of my own way, you know, the emotional intent will be behind the making, you know, will show up that way. I, I just have to say, for the, when you were talking about the, the projecting and whether, because you're projecting, you're just copying, of course, I mean, we know that people have been projecting to make their art since 
the Dutch masters, right? At least, of course. One of yeah. the things I, I'm teaching a class right now called the Material World, and one of the things we really focused on was how advances in the technology of glass, allowing mirrors and lenses and telescopes and microscopes, that visionary access to those different kinds of scales. Uh, allowed and these kinds of technologies really allowed people to see the world in such a different way, and that manifests itself in art and also just generally in humanism and, and recentering the human experience at a, at a scale and recognizing there are other scales. So it just reminds me of that sort of story. Well, also just to follow up on that with the the materials that you use here, and you're you're teaching a, um, a, a course about materials, materialism, and that there are so many different meanings to that. Um, the art historical kind of background would be arte povera, using everyday materials that people are you know use in their everyday life. They're not precious. It's not gold or bronze or or something like that, a sort of like rarefied, which brings in a kind of class aspect to who are you creating art for, who would buy it, who would own it. Um, and so that also has an emotional component that people can relate to masking tape and a bungee cord. And they have that, they own that themselves. And just making art out of that um, gives a more direct personal connection. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Do we have other questions? Mm. Um, what would you call a great so there was a myth uh, for much of the latter half of the 20th century. Maybe you've heard these things like, well, your, your brain is fully formed at seven years old, and that's why it's so much harder to learn languages. Or, 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 that, you know, or just generally this idea that, well, I have this, I'm hardwired this way. Uh, this is just the way my brain works. And uh, while on one hand, situating personal experience in the brain and recognizing that there is a material component to experience, that's really important and undeniable. Our brains determine a lot about how we think and act. But um, I'm always, but, but uh, in the last few decades, people have realized that in fact, your brain is not fixed at seven and that you can make actions and take activities and learn new things. And again, the, the metaphor is overworked, but can rewire your brain Right, and so neuroplasticity is is the general sort of name for that. Right, that plastic in the sense that your brain, uh, yeah, as uh, so elastic. Right, you deform it, it returns to the same. Plastic, you deform it, and it doesn't return to the same shape. So that notion uh, of of plastic. I'm intrigued by um, the opposites in, t in technique and philosophy of the two media here. And I'm, I'm just curious as to, dynamically, how do you change from one mode to the other? Do you do it alternately? Do you have got the series finished and start with this? Or how's your pro what's your process? Yeah, so... I, um, the so I do think about both things simultaneously, um, but they will go. Uh, I, I things tend to go in waves a little bit. Um, the uh, so I was doing a um, a number of portraits uh, uh, the summer of the election, actually in 2016, and of course there were so many. Um, there were all the things in the news with the election, but also, um, you know, uh, uh, all the killings of, of, you know, unarmed black motorists and all the types of the news shootings, mass shootings that were happening. If, if you remember, that summer was really quite rough uh, that year. And um, so I was doing portraits and I was doing several, almost all of the portraits, the small portraits that you see over there, they actually come from that period. But I was also doing portraits of things from the news. And um, 
you know, images that I, uh, all sorts of, I mean, if you remember all sorts of images of, of that we were seeing at those times, incredibly powerful of, of, of protesters, of people having to, to speak to the public about their loved ones and, th and so forth. And I also started drawing those things. And it was difficult, um, but it also, uh, I have to say I was incredibly unsatisfied with those drawings, mostly because I felt that um, all I could do was simply reflect and follow the things I was seeing. There was no, I had no, it was so awful, there wasn't really anything as an artist that I was adding other than simply the fact that I was bearing witness to it, which was fine, which was wonderful except the fact that the photographs that were in the news every single day were better. They were better at it than what I was doing. And so I was not only following them in time, I wasn't even living up to the standard that they had set. And so I felt that um, portraits had to, had to go to the side for a bit. Um, and uh, they didn't, were not adequate to kind of reflect. And to be honest with you, I know this sounds crazy, but it might sound crazy, but this idea of counting and infinities and mathematics and things that, that are not of this time, that will be here after this era passes and after we pass, um, that was somehow more consoling, and this idea of infinities and counting and doing something over and over again, it actually made more sense to me in that moment. And so that was kind of the trigger. I'd been doing both, but then it flopped more over into the, the, the mathematical side. Um, and, but at the same time, you know, honestly, since, since doing this show, I look and, uh, you know, I've heard the reaction, and the reaction has been good and bad to both uh, to portraits and to people seeing their portrait being done. And I realize that the, the power that an image, the image of a person, the image of a face can have, it's, it, it is people react to it. In the end, it's a bunch of marks on paper. It's just a little, you know, it's just a few little dents and a bit of color on, on a flat surface. But the fact that it can have such an effect and such an impact on person, drive them to really extreme emotions even, you know, reminds me that like, you know, the power that an image has. And so, you know, now I think, okay, a little bit more about the portraits. Um, and so, you know, they're, for me, they're, they're, they are two separate bodies. I do think of them as two separate bodies of work, uh, and they do come and go. Um, but uh, I don't know. They're both very active. They're just sort of two streams wrapping around each other, but they're both, uh, you know, they're both flowing at, at, at a good speed, if that, if that metaphor makes any sense. Thank you. Um, thanks. So... I feel like I'm sort of sitting underneath this arc of your lines, and I keep looking in between you two at the cross, at the uh, hatching that you've done, the cross hatching that you've done, and that ear over there. And I feel like there's some relationship for me going on. And I kind of have wondered, like, have you ever thought about is there an algorithm to the um, hatching that you use to create these? dimensions and bring a flat surface into a different place? I, I do think there is an aspect of when you break down a face or break down different parts of a human being, you know, that does start to become about the mechanics of, of, making, a, of making a face. And somehow I've come to kind of trust the fact that that dive into that, just basically how something is constructed is actually still humanist, you know, that to actually look at something that way and sort of see how it breaks down, you don't lose um, who the person is. In a certain way, you can let who the person is come through. So, um, yes, yes, I sort of trust the, you know, the analytic nature. And if that lends itself to even an algorithmic take on 
hair or skin or nails or glasses or reflections of things or clothing um, and patterns on clothing. I'm a big fan of patterns on clothing. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I let that happen. Uh, that just r reminds me of how I often, uh, sometimes when I talk to people in the humanities and I, I talk about reductionism, I mean, and again, I study how physical objects are made out of atoms. So I mean reductionism in the most <laughs> you know, truest sense of reducing things to their constituents. And I find often the humanities find that that kind of analysis very cold again. But I, I think that, that what you, you've just, the way you're, you're describing breaking down uh, the face and that that process, that reduction, just because there are scales Right, and at some scales there is a there is a, a system, and at other scales there are other things going on. There may be less systematic, right? That does reductionism is not a bad word. Reductionism is not a curse word. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it also relates to um, ideas of proportion and symmetry, that the human eye is just naturally attracted to certain I ideal proportions. That Renaissance artists worked a lot with that idea. I don't know, seven heads fit into the height of a human body and that someone with very symmetrical features is just considered intuitively more attractive. So all that type of mathematics seems to be built into the human brain. Yeah, I think so. I mean, looking for patterns, looking for systems that govern things, I think is a very natural thing. Um, and I think when you, I take very seriously what, appears in cave paintings, you know, and it's basically, it's, it's, it's people and animals, um, it's uh, uh, symbols, patterns, and, um, and then, you know, to a lesser extent, sort of places and events. And those are still some of the main things that show up. But I think that, you know, this thing of looking at people and looking at patterns, this idea of trying to find patterns and meanings and things that interconnect things, like logic, you, we want, we're, we're desperate to sort of see, naturally, I think it's built in, to see a logic that somehow governs what's happening. Um, I think that that is, yeah, I think that that is innate, and I would say, I wouldn't necessarily be, you know, I, I, I'm, I've, I've, I'm, I'm long enough in the tooth to, to not necessarily want to, you know, go to the mathematics of the Renaissance, but the fact that there is a mathematics sort of governing it would be something I would be very drawn to. Yep, Ellen? Mm. To me, I don't really need that. To me, this, <laughs> this show, I have a loud voice. This, this show is about the joy of being an artist, you know, because you can do these are two so very, very different bodies of work. And you can do them both. And that's just great. You, you can do them both, and nobody can say, uh-uh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that, that's being an artist at its best. Oh, well, that's a wonderful comment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, amen, yes. You know, I mean, that's, um, you know, that's, yeah, exactly. I mean, the effect, you get, you get to do what you want. You know, I mean, and, and who could, you know, that's, that's a great, that's a great thing to have. Absolutely. Yeah. So I actually just, Nate, I did want to just take a minute to talk about um, just something that's very important to me because as I work with more and more students and, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and being, you know, that we're colleagues here at the university, just talking a little bit about the whole STEM and STEAM thing. If, if you wouldn't mind talking about that and the inclusion and what that means. I think, um, I think you know, it's, it's, so for people who don't know, STEM is science, engineering, technology, math, and there's, it's, it's basically, it's, it's idea of grouping these as a curriculum, but also as almost a social body in a sense. Um, and Cult. Then, uh, yes, and then, but then also there's been this sort of recent push to switch STEM to STEAM, which is incorporating um, art into those, those other four fields. And, um, you know, it's something very close to my heart, but I also think it's something that, and I think that is amazing, or can be amazing, but I think it's something that's a little bit misunderstood in my, in my estimation. And I just wanted to get your thoughts coming from the other side, from the STEM side, not the A side. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, so the, the part... 
So first off, let's admit that within STEM, because just as a brand, that has been tremendously successful in the last, I mean, nobody even knew what STEM, what, like that phrase, suddenly STEM education, STEM, uh, NASA just changed their Office of Education to the Office of STEM Engagement, right? <laughs> so, so as a brand, uh, it has been so successful, and I'll admit within some of my colleagues, adding A to STEM is, uh, they have a reaction to it just as, as a, well, you're sort of messing with the brand there, buddy. It's not Coca-Cola, you know what I mean? Like, why would you do that? Um, so, so, so there is, there is that, and, and, um, and within the, the STEM culture as, as such, and I don't want to overgeneralize, it's not homogenous, um, there is, uh, I, you know, it is a culture that sometimes feels victimized, uh, and, 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 you know, not mainstream. And so, again, there's also a tribalism. It's like, well, I, art, art, art has their own silo. Why are they trying to get into our silo? So, okay, so, so first off, th there is that aspect, right? The part that, that the STEM community likes, I think, certainly is uh, we're also desperate to be recognized that STEM is a creative field, right? And, and often feel like, oh, well, those, those, you know, STEM, they're marching along to their little algorithms and not actually doing anything creative. So, so that is something that is a welcome uh, addition to the brand, right? Um, just to say a little bit about uh, American University, we've made a, a commitment in the Don Myers Technology and Innovation Building over there, uh, and I encourage especially students, but any community members, can, they have open hours, 30 hours a week, to what's called DABL, the Design and Build Lab. And it has everything from uh, hand tools and paintbrushes to 3D printers, laser cutters, vinyl cutters, sewing machines. And so it is a space for students to, with, uh, and at this point it's not oversubscribed, and so it has pretty much free materials, to go in there and to do creative projects, research projects, entrepreneurial projects. And so one of the reasons I jumped at this opportunity, honestly, was to advertise that uh, I think at AU, our STEM community is eager to engage with the arts community, and this space, I think, could really be a place of intersection. It is a lot of fun. It's, it's open to anyone with an AUID. So that's maybe a little restrictive, depending on who's in the audience. But, but that, that's at least where it is now, although I don't think a visitor would be turned away. Uh, anyway, so I, I could say more about that. Um, uh, the other, yeah, good. Uh, the other thing, I just saw this flyer up, and I just want to say this out loud because I don't exactly know who's sponsoring this, but there are posters all over Don Myers. There's going to be a chalk in on uh, December 7th, I think it is? 5th to the 7th. So uh, one of the things we in the sciences really fought for, or at least in mathematics and physics, is to have chalkboards all over the building. Because the material of chalk, first off, it's so much better than a whiteboard. Whiteboard markers go bad even when you don't use them. Whiteboards get stained and go bad even if you don't use them. A box of chalk is good for 100 years. A blackboard is good for 100 years. Yes, it makes dust. But if you can put away the dust phobia, or the, I mean, and again, some people have allergies, whatever. But if, if you could get over the dust... Chalk is a wonderful medium for instruction, and, and physicists and mathematicians love it to do their work. We all insisted to have chalkboards, and our hallways are covered with chalk, and so there's going to be a chalk in uh, the 5th through the 7th. So I encourage anybody who wants to uh, use, to take, uh, to explore this medium, I'm really excited for this. I've been, I, I, I don't know who's even organizing it, but I'm so excited to see. Uh, they're going to be doing sidewalks on all the boards, and I strongly encourage anybody to come over, look at it, check it out. Maybe by Friday night then, it's going to be looking pretty sweet. So. Awesome. <laughs> well, um, I think we'll be around if anyone wants to talk to the artist or to Professor Harshman, and I just wanted to thank Jack for your support of this exhibit. Thank Ian, and thank you all for being here tonight. <laughs>